Who wants to get in the Word of God, say aye. aye. All right, Carol and Roy, will you guys start making your way up here? So uh, we are so blessed uh, to have the Birches in this church family. Many of you guys know who they are, but if you don't, I get to introduce them. So these guys have been here longer than my family, and we came in 93, and Roy and Carol have been uh, walking with the Lord and serving God and in this church for so many years. Um, and these guys, you know what they do? They use their giftings for the Lord. They really love to use their giftings for the Lord, and they're very gifted. Both of them, in my opinion, could be leading very lucrative businesses in many ways. They both have been in the business world, but about uh, 13 years ago, they're just like, we want to go all in using our giftings only just for the Lord um, and for the nation of Israel, and that's where they've been uh, for 13 years. And uh, they're back now, and we're so blessed that Roy and Carol, you guys want to be in our church family? Again, we're so blessed. Uh, we don't take that for granted to have special uh, people that we hold in high honor, like both of you. So Carol gets to bring the word. Uh, Carol's going to um, transition the mic, though, to her husband, I think, in a moment. So, all right, go ahead, Carol. My husband's going to pray for Israel because we think that God thinks a lot about Israel, cares a lot about Israel, and he wants his people throughout the world to be praying for his plans, his protection, the people that he has returned to the land, especially in these days. And in case you aren't aware of it, you know, what happens in Israel affects what happens in the United States. So I think it's, my husband's now going to pray. Okay. All right, yeah, I'm going to pray. Up with the mic. Hello? Um, <laughs> um, so, Lord, Heavenly Father, um, just want to come before your throne and um, thank you that you're a God that uh, here's prayer, and that we have access to you through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, uh, you see what's happening over in Israel, how uh, they just want to have peace, but other nations have started wars against them. And so, Lord, I just pray um, for that land and the Jewish people that uh, you would, uh, like your word says, you'll never... You never slumber your sleep, Lord, and you watch over Israel. And you, t and you tell us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Lord. And so um, I just pray that, uh, Lord, um, the, the land there, the people are in a, a pretty dark place right now. I've talked to my friends over there, and the whole spirit is uh, a lot of people are uh, stressed out and discouraged. And Lord, we, um, so we just pray to you that you would stretch out your hand and, and uh, remember that land, remember Israel, remember your covenant with, uh, the, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the Jewish people, Lord. And uh, Lord, you see there will, be, there will never really be peace cause unless they turn to you, Lord, because you are the Prince of Peace. And uh, so, yeah, Lord, just want to uh, put these prayers before you, offer these prayers to you uh, from our church here, from each one of us. And in Jesus, your holy name, amen. So today we're going to look at Daniel 7. As you know, um, Josh and Randy have um, walked us through the first six chapters of the book of Daniel. And Daniel 7 is, um, if you read it from verse 1 to the end, you'll probably go, what's, I can't figure this out at all. But actually, it can be figured out somewhat, and that's what I'm going to try to do today. So before I, we actually dig into the scriptures, um, I want to set the stage, because what Daniel 7 contains are the first visions and dreams, and therefore the first prophecies of Daniel that he himself received from God and gave to us. He interpreted dreams before and visions before, but those were other people's you know, visions and dreams. But these are the first ones that Daniel received. So there are things we need to understand about prophecies, um, especially in this book. They are not always presented in chronological order. In other words, there's a beginning and then a middle and then we have the end. It's not like that at all. In most prophecies, especially in the Old Testament, and even um, in Matthew 24, which is a very prophetic book, 
And so we will see that for sure here. So um, let's see. Um, an example would be that at the very beginning, we'll read about the beast and the fourth beast especially. And then later on in verse 19, we'll read something. And then in verse 27, we'll read something. And it's kind of like that. So that's the first thing we have to understand when we approach this book, that it doesn't come in chronological order. And the other thing to know about prophecies is they don't always refer to one time period. In other words, there's a prophecy here, like there was a prophecy about the return of Is the Jewish people to the land of Israel. There were prophecies about that. Well, that happened after um, the Babylonian exile, and then it happened in the 20th century, 19th and 20th century, and it's happening now. So we can just see the principle that prophecies can refer to more than one event, the same prophecy. Okay, the next thing to um, keep in mind is about structure. Again, we have a very, um, what I call Western mindset. You, you want to present information, so you start here, and then you move along here, and then you kind of finish at the end, and that's kind of the big bang. But that's not how it works in Hebrew prophecies and writings. The, sometimes the most important part is in the very middle, and that's true for this chapter too. So it's a very common way, even in Psalms, if you read them, and you can sometimes find in the middle the key message, and in the book of Isaiah. So that's a principle of reading the Old Testament, and even in Paul's writing, because he, guess what, he was Hebrew, so it makes sense. So that's something that we want to keep in the back of our minds. Um, the third thing, and this is true for actually any passage of scripture, it's very helpful to look for what I call key words, words that are repeated over and over again. And in this book, the key word is the word king and kingdoms and other words associated with them, those two words. So king, kingdoms, dominion, sovereignty, and thrones, because that's where kings sit, right, on thrones. So that is the key word for Daniel chapter 7. And the key word tells us what the main theme of the book is, the main theme of the passage. And this is true in other writings, too. When you go to study the Bible in the New Testament, you can look for this idea of key words. It will help you with your study. Okay, so in the book of Daniel, so you get the... I, I, you know, my father was a lawyer, so I'm kind of like a lawyer, too. I mean, he went to law school. To prove my point about key words, um, my genetic heritage here, in the book of this chapter, the key words around king, kingdoms, dominion, sovereignty occur 14 times. That's a lot in any passage. So that is our theme. That's the theme. Okay, now we're ready to kind of look at scripture, verses 1 through 8. Now, there's a lot here, and I am not going to read this. Oh, but I'm going to highlight certain parts of it. So chapter, verse 1, and you can kind of read it while I talk, um, just tells us when this, these visions and dreams came to Daniel. And it says, in the first year of Belshazzar. Belshazzar. So the interesting thing to note is that this actually occurred before chapters 5 and 6. What happened in chapter 5? That was the last year of Belshazzar, the handwriting on the wall. So these visions occurred even before that. And then chapter 6 is Daniel in the lion's den. And that was during the time of Dar Darius, who was the um, king, ruler of Medo-Persia. OK, so what occurred? So if you look through this, he um, says in verse 1, I saw a dream, a dream and visions. So what is happening is he sees his dreams and visions, and now he's going to explain what he saw. So because there's so much to talk about, I can't, you know, I can't tell you everything. If we had five hours, then we could really do it, but we don't. So the basic things in the dream were four beasts. The first one was an, a lion. Now imagine, you have to kind of use your imagination. Not just any old lion, but a lion 
with wings of an eagle. That's weird. Lion with wings? Okay. You can imagine what that must have looked like to Daniel. There was a bear with three ribs in his mouth and the leopard with four heads and four wings. How many of you have seen leopards with four heads and four wings? So you get the idea. These were really strange and very vivid to Daniel. And then there's another beast that isn't even given an animal name, but he's given, um, so he's described as dreadful, like highlighted here, dreadful, terrifying, and strong. So he's described, and he will be described again with these same words. So what are these? What do these animals represent? Well, in verse 17, which is not up here, I don't think, um, the explanation is clearly provided for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And what it says is these great beasts are for kings. Well, there's that theme again, key word. For kings who will arise from the earth. And in verse 23, it says that the fourth beast, it goes into more detail about him, is, will be a fourth kingdom. So really, the two words are different in Hebrew, king and kingdom, but it's the same concept. These are kings and kingdoms. Um, and that's what these animals represent. Okay, so does this ring a bell to anyone who heard um, the, the sermon on chapter 2? There were four, there's a statue and they had four different medals, right? It turns out it's the same, referring to the same kingdoms. And all scholars agree. So um, they represent the four kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Okay? And this, this is the interesting thing, in case you forget how much you learned in ancient history when you were in high school is that these actually existed in real history and in real time and in this order. So in other words, this prophecy and the prophecy in chapter 2 has already been fulfilled, this part of the prophecy. It's pretty exciting. Yeah. You think? So now we're thinking about God and what we learned from this passage. So the first thing we can note is that God gives man prophecies, and then he fulfills them. Isn't that nice of him? So I think that's pretty cool. So we can count on the prophecies in the Bible, the ones we do understand, the ones we don't, that they will all be fulfilled. This also tells us that he knows things we don't know, especially the future. Right? You think God knows the future? That's one part of what makes him God. Okay, And not only that, he knows everything about history, what was, what is, and will to be to come. And the third thing, he's actually interested in kings and kingdoms. Hmm. In politics, we have a God who's interested in politics. Yeah, you know, I was told Christians shouldn't be interested in politics. Well, God is interested in politics. Maybe we should take an interest in that, too. Okay. And um, the other thing that is in chapter 2, verse 21, it says that God actually removes kings and appoints kings. So he's kind of in charge of a lot of things. So why would this be relevant today, November 3rd, <laughs> on Sunday, to us? Like, isn't the word of God kind of relevant to our lives a little? Every day. Every day but we're kind of heightened lately, because on Tuesday, there's going to be a new king appointed, right? It'll be either Donald Trump or, or what's her name, Kamala Harris. And guess what? God already knows who that's going to be. He knows for sure because he knows the future. And he has something to do with the choice of who it's going to be. Now, this is where we can get kind of let the, the devil lie to us and say, well, he knows everything, so I don't have to do anything. Yeah, because I need to sit back and let him do whatever he wants, because he knows. But there are two things to keep in mind. One is that he is, even though he knows, and he makes a choice, he's influenced by prayer. 
God actually responds to our prayer. Therefore, we, being in his image and supposedly being interested in political things, should be praying about those things. And I believe I've seen that many believers throughout the world, not only in America, are play, praying a lot about this new king that's going to be over the land of the United States. And the other thing is you, we can vote. Right? Now, we live in California, and so, you know, what difference does it make? My one little vote, all these millions of votes. But that's not why we vote. We vote because we've been given the responsibility to vote. And we vote because it, we exhibit that we value our citizenship. And so we vote before God. We do it because it pleases God. <coughs> so that's my speech for all you people. <laughs> I, don't think, I hope there's nobody here who's choosing not to vote. OK. So the third thing about this is, well, what if we don't like his choice? Uh, like that's not, uh, that's, uh. <laughs> you know, the one that we think should be or want to be president. I won't mention who that is, but I think you all know. What if that person isn't the one that's chosen to lead this country? What are we going to do with that? <laughs> well, we're going to trust God because God's purposes are not our purposes. And he as we're going to see, has a bigger plan. He's not just interested in this. He's interested in this. And so that's where we can find our peace, knowing and trusting that God is all wise and in control, and he knows what he's doing. That's where I find my peace. OK. So now, the next slide. Um, no. Verses. 7 and 8 and 19 through 26? Nope, nope, back. Ah, here we are. Nice long passage, right? So let's I'll give you a general idea of what's in here. This is all about the, the fourth beast. Daniel is very curious. Are you curious? I hope so. Very strange beast. And that's what we're going to see. So the first thing I want us to notice are what I call the facts. And um, we read what the beast is like and what he does. And I was able to highlight that or have Brent do that. He's dreadful and terrifying and strong. And this is what he does. He devours, he crushes, and he tramples down. And he, this is repeated. I'm showing you all these scriptures to show you this we find in verse 7. Then we find it again in 19. Then we find it again in 23. This is how these scriptures are presented to us, not just one time, but more than once and throughout the vision. OK, so it's this way. And the other thing that you can read in there if you want to read or take my word for it, because it's in there, is that this beast, first of all, it's not like a nice little pet, you know? This isn't some nice little thing that you want to scratch under the cheek or, you know, tickle their ears. This is a beast, and this is what the beast does. Very, very awful things. Okay, this beast has ten horns. That's pretty good. So first thing to note is the symbolism. Horns are symbolic of power and authority over kingdoms, basically. And so that's why there were 10 horns. The other thing is the number 10. The number 10 tells us that, um, and it's often throughout scripture, um, it signifies completeness. So what we're seeing is the completeness of all of God's planning. So all this we're seeing is kind of the end of God's story. It's the completeness of every, all history. And so that's a picture of what we're about to see. Um, and so out of this ten horns, it says that three horns arise, and then one horn arises, rises up above all of them. And this horn is called a little horn here and then horn throughout this passage. But later on in the writings of Daniel and in Revelation, it's also called the little horn. So I'm going to call him the little horn. And I noticed one of the things he did um, somewhere in verse 
uh, the last word of the first piece, there the word boasts, and then in the middle the word boasts. So this little horn is very boastful, okay? And I said to myself, what, what do you think the most boastful thing he might be saying? That's it. What did you say? I am God. That's the most boastful thing any of us say. No, I am my own God. I don't need God as human beings. But he's saying, I am God. And he calls people to worship him later on in Revelation and so forth. The point being, that's his biggest boast. He boasts, he wages war against the saints, verse 21 and 25, I'm sure they're up here, and overpowers them. He speaks against God, verse 25, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. And that's what that really refers to is he, take, he wants to take the place of God. Those words really, because who is it that sets up times? We are told that God is in charge of times and seasons, and he's the one that set up the laws for worship and also the, the law for what is good and evil. He, his law distinguishes what is good and what is evil. And so we can see this character trying to alter. Have you noticed that lately in the when you look online and read things in newspaper, how things are being altered, what is right and what is wrong, all of a sudden this is wrong and this is right. That's that spirit behind the operation of this little horn. He's, it also tells us he will be given dominion for a time, time, and half a time, which is biblical language for three and a half years. And it's in other places in scripture which is half of what? The time of the tribulation, verse 7. But it also tells us his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. That's a nice word there. Okay. So what are we really seeing here when we look at this fourth beast? Now, what I'm about to say is supported by Bible scholars and also supported in further chapters of Daniel, Matthew 24, Second Thessalonians, Paul's writing, and the book of Revelation. So if we had the five hours, I could show you all those scriptures, but you have to take my word for it. Okay, so first of all, this fourth piece is more than, more symbol, symbolic of more than just the Roman Empire. And this was true in the chapter two also. So it's really symbolic of a kingdom that encompasses the whole world. So what does that mean? That one day there will be a one world government. Right? That's what that really means. And the whole world government. Okay. The little horn is symbolic of the Antichrist, the man who represents everything inspired by Satan, everything that stands against God and godliness. He will rise to power from within a league of 10 kings, 10 future kings. He will blaspheme God, persecute the saints during the tribulation, right up to the return of Jesus. Okay. And I already mentioned what time, times, and half of times means. Okay, so what we have here is a glimpse, a glimpse of the final acts of God's drama, a glimpse of the Antichrist and the end times. Okay, well, it's 2024, right? Why is that important now in this year? Because you know, we don't know when that's going to happen. Do you know when it's going to happen? No, I don't. Okay. Because it's coming to pass even now. Time, the, what's go, this is described is closer than it was yesterday, certainly closer than it was October 7th, certainly closer than it was, you know, 10 years ago. Okay. Uh, COVID, anyone observe what happened during COVID? The whole world bowed to some dictate from the World Health Organization. And then there, underneath that, California, I heard, like, things were closed. You always had to wear masks. I, don't, I didn't live here then. Um, you could have church, right? 
and they had to have it in Zoom, and then maybe outside with only five. I don't know how it, what it was. But we all felt the restrictions that were placed upon us, and we all more or less submitted to it. And what was it based on more than anything else, by the way? Fear, lies and fear. It worked because people were afraid. Just an observation. And it worked because there is an internet. The internet keeps us all connected and you, basically you can't do anything without the internet anymore. You need it for your phone, you need to pay bills, you need it for this and that. Okay? You get the picture. Has anyone heard of the World Economic Forum? Oh, good. I hadn't heard of it too, more or less recently. And they meet every year in Davos, Switzerland. They're a group of the richest, uh, most influential people in all the world. And basically, they want a one world government. OK, the scary thing is to look on their website, I, which I did. This is what their goal is. It sounds so good. Really sounds good. Improving the state of the world. Aren't we all for that? Ending poverty. Oh, yes, let's end poverty. Ensuring gender equality. In other words, men and women treated equally. Um, protecting the planet. We must protect the planet. Global uh, cooperation, and so on. All sounds so good. And we don't need God's help to do it. We're going to do it ourselves. That's the missing ingredients. OK. So those things tell us not only is it coming closer, but it's very possible. After COVID, I saw it. I came to the conclusion, this is really possible to really get the whole world under one government. And there's one other little sign that tells us it's coming closer, my favorite one. 1948, the birth of Israel. Because Jesus said, learn the parable from the fig tree, because as soon as its branch has become tender and sprouts its leaves, you will know that summer is near. The fig tree is symbolic of Israel. So that's it. OK, so what is our response to this, this fulfillment, this close, the coming closer to the fulfillment of Daniel 7? We are not to be afraid. We are not to be afraid, but we are to be aware. We know who knows um, the future. We know who know who's in control. And we are to trust. And God knows the very end of the story. And he gave it to us. Ta-da! Next slide. Here. This is the very end of the story. Notice it's in the middle, verse 9. I kept looking until thrones were set up. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. OK. Kind of have to picture what's being painted here. The Ancient of Days, we all know who that is. right? It's God himself, the everlasting God from before time and into the future. And all these descriptions are similar to descriptions in other passages in the Bible, especially Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Revelation. OK, and so now what's happening, middle of verse 10, thousands upon thousands were serving him. Myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court convened, and the books were opened. OK, so what's this seat that he's taking? It's the judgment seat. And in Revelation 20, verse 11 through 13, there's the same picture in fuller detail. OK, so this is a glimpse of the judgment seat of God. Now, what is God's judgment? Would you like to know? Verse 11, I'm not sure. Yeah, there it is. It's up there. The beast is slain and burned in fire. So that's a future event. Verse 12 tells us, you can read it here, the dominion of all the beasts are taken away. And that already happened. 
that's the thing that happened. But it's interesting because when Daniel saw the vision, none of it had happened. When he had the vision, even the Medo-Persians hadn't come into play yet. So what was his future is our past, but also what was his future is our future. Okay, what else is part of the um, end of the story? Next. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So who's the son of man? Right. And in the book of Matthew, what did he call himself? How many times? 28. <laughs> a lot. Just to make sure he was connecting himself to this vision. So he, um, and how is, he, how is he coming? With clouds. Does that sound familiar? Matthew, Mark, 2 Thessalonians, Revelation, all talk about Jesus coming in the clouds. See how prophecy works? You find it in other places, but it's here as clear as the bell. Okay. And to him was given dominion, honor, and a kingdom so that all the peoples, nations, and populations of all languages might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So what was that song we sang today? Jesus, do what? Have it all? Well, guess what? He will have it all. Right? That's what this is telling us. He will have it all. Okay? So he's given dominion, glory, and the kingdom. So I want to highlight this picture because what this really is is his coronation. Right? This whole scene is when King Jesus, Jesus comes before the Father and he is coronated. He's given the crown of crowns. He becomes Melechim, Melechim, the king of kings. And this is what the scene is. This is the coronation of Jesus. I hope this excites your spirit because this is what's going to happen. And all people will serve him. And unlike the kingdoms of this earth, his kingdom will not be destroyed. Ever. Ever. So Paul writes in Ephesians 1.18, that he wants the eyes of our heart to be open, enlightened, so we would know two things, the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So what is the inheritance of the saints? Well, we get to see that too. Verse um, 18, 22, and 27. That's in there somewhere. You can read it. We saints will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. We saints will take possession of the kingdom. It's, the idea is repeated. The sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to us, the people of the saints of the highest one. This is our future. This is what God has prepared for us. When we think of what eternity is, we will have authority. We will be ruling as kings and priests with King Jesus forever and ever. Sounds pretty good to me. Okay, so why should we learn these things now? Because that seems so far away. Oh, and I have to pay bills tomorrow, and I have a dentist appointment, and my best friend's going for the chemotherapy. You know, why should, I, why should I know this? Well, for one thing, knowing these kind of prophecies um, give us hope. In all our circumstances, we have this hope. They also widen our vision and focus. I have a little bit of a pet peeve about life in America. We are like this. We really are focused on what's happening here and now. It's in human nature. Once you've been spent a lot of time outside of Los Osos, you get to see that Los Osos is not the center of the world. <laughs> And it's not the center of God's world either. And it's good for us to kind of remember that, I think, once in a while. So that's my pet peeve. Okay. It helps us know God's purposes. And so we have a deeper understanding of what God's plan is. 
number. And so you know that there's no way that Israel is going to be wiped from the river to the sea, for example. That's never going to happen. Okay. We, it also should shape our view and motivate us to live a life of faith because we can have faith in his word. And, um, yeah. So that's a good reason. So I want to tell you a little story before I end because it's my story. Take off my glasses. I, have to read. This, I, I, I journal. I've been journaling for years, and um, I am also now rereading my journal, and I came across the story. I wrote this in May 12, 2020. So um, I used to go for a walk. We had a dog named Jaffa. We lived near the desert, and I would take Jaffa for a walk. I now call this pathway um, back and forth, and I would walk and talk with God. So I don't even know why particularly, but for one day or one day when I was talking to God, this idea came into my mind that there was a courtroom up there in the heavens. God has a courtroom. And all of a sudden, you know, things, now I don't see visions, but thoughts. I just imagined there was somebody who was, um, that I care very deeply about. I was standing in the courtroom, you know, God on the throne, the big bench, the judge. And I was standing there next to somebody I care about very deeply. To the left was Satan, the accuser of the brethren, and to the right was Jesus. And so Satan stood up and began to tell, this is my mind's eye, all the things that this person that I cared about had done wrong. Well, the list was quite long, because <laughs> we all have a long <laughs> list when you think about it. And... And I wanted God to give him mercy. Oh, God, mercy, please, mercy. And Satan kept talking and talking. And there was no defense because all the things Satan had said were true. You know, did you shoot that person, this person? You know, well, yeah, there's a gun and there's a dead person. Yeah, I shot that person. There's no disputing that. So that kind of thing. All of those accusations were true. All of a sudden, Jesus stood up. And he stood, stood up, he had been sitting. He stood up, and I just remember this. He took a stick, which happened to be the cross. He went like that, just like that. That was our defense. That stick, that cross, the blood upon that cross, Satan disappeared. All the mercy that I had cried out for was given to my friend and a little to me. <laughs> Because that's how powerful, that's how effective that cross is. And it's the only way, the only way all the accusations of Satan can be wiped away. There's no other way. And yet it is it. It is the most powerful. And so that was just mind-blowing to me and it has stuck with me because it was so dramatic for me. So I want... You, if you haven't yet asked for what, you know, gone to the cross and acknowledged what the cross can do for you and what the blood of Jesus can do for you, I really encourage you to do that because you will be standing at that judgment seat of God. Every one of us will be. And that's the only way we will be declared innocent. So that's my story. Okay, we're not done. Well, that's God's story. That's God's story. So, just to summarize, because um, I'll tell you why you have to summarize, so you remember what we just read. <laughs> you might even think about it. Okay, we have the theme, kings, dominion, kingdoms that are given and taken away by God. Man's kingdom's temporary, God's kingdom forever and ever and ever. But we were given, through this chapter, a glimpse of the most amazing things. We were given a glimpse of the Antichrist. I don't really want to see that, but it's going to happen. We were given a glimpse of the last day's calendar. God has a calendar. He's very sensitive to times and timing, and he has a calendar, and we now know what's part of that calendar, three and a half years. We were given a glimpse of God's judgment seat, and we were given in the books a glimpse of the Son of Man, Jesus, in heaven, and a glimpse of the final destiny of the saints. 
So I just want to thank God for what he gave Daniel, those visions, and what he gave Daniel to give to us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to kind of direct our path, and to know without a doubt how the end of the story will come to pass for ourselves personally and for the whole world. He's a great God. <laughs>